Um, it's a great uh, pleasure to uh, welcome a writer I've admired for a long time, admired his craft and skill and uh, talents, in particular tricks. Uh, Sebastian Junger is, is one of the most acclaimed journalists in the world. He was born in 1962, alas, uh, after me, and uh, came, uh, after many of us, in fact, uh, came to public attention, a massive public attention, uh, with the best-selling The Perfect Storm, in 1997, about the 1991 uh, sinking of the Gloucester fishing trawler, the Andrea Gale. Uh, it was made into a massively popular film, which I'm sure everybody saw. Uh, he is, however, almost as famous for his other journalism, uh, which includes his second book, a Death in Belmont, which is a re-examination and a surprising re-encounter uh, with the Boston Strangler murders. Uh, his third book is Fire, a collection of essays about places and people. It is much, much, much safer uh, to read about than it is to actually visit. Uh, among them uh, Sierra Leone, where he investigates the deadly diamond trade, uh, Idaho, where he followed uh, firefighters in the blazing forest, Kosovo, to write about genocide, and many tours in Afghanistan. Uh, his most recent book is set, as, is set in Afghanistan. It's called War. It follows one platoon of soldiers for more than a year uh, in one of the most dangerous uh, forward outposts in Afghanistan to find out why men like to fight. It turns out they do. Uh, his, the book is accompanied by a documentary, Restrepo, which uh, won the two, uh, 2010 Grand Jury uh, Prize at the um, Sundance Film Festival. Uh, Mr. Junger has won a National Magazine Award and the SAS Novartis Prize for Journalism, which is no mean feat. He lives in New York City with his family. Would you please give him a very warm welcome? Toronto. Thank you. It's great, great to be here. It's a very dangerous city, um, as you, uh, you may not know. I well, maybe wonder. Is that on now? No. Yes. Oh, yeah. There it goes. Um, fantastic. Uh, it, it made me wonder if your does your wife know you're here in Toronto, being interviewed? Yes, she does. She does. So d does she? Do you talk to her about going to, you know, live in the middle of a forest fire, or in the middle of, uh, you know, a war that's very, very dangerous? Do you, do you ask her if you can go? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yes, I do ask. Um, it's part of a conversation where I offer things, and it's part of a negotiation. It's like, can I spend a year off and on with a platoon of combat infantry at a remote outpost in Afghanistan if I promise to never, ever, ever do it again? That <laughs> It's that kind of conversation. You know, you're the kind of guy that I would never just accept that statement from. <laughs> and yeah. she says yes, under those conditions. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to stop war reporting, but um, that particular kind of, you know, very, I mean, you know, and also, I mean, as a journalist, I don't quite need to do that again. Like, I'm, I, if I did that again with another platoon, I wouldn't find out much that I didn't already know. So, um, but, I'm, I, you know, I certainly will keep covering conflict. You know, in Fire, uh, which is a book of essays, a great book of essays, but one of the, uh, the, the introduction, I think, to, the, to that book begins with you talking about how you wanted to do something that scared you. And I have the, the impression, I had the impression reading, reading War more recently, that you're always trying to come to terms in your writing with your own relationship to courage. That, which made me think that you must have been afraid at some point, which seems unlikely. But then you write about being afraid when you write, that, that when you write, you're always completely convinced that it's going to be a, a disaster. What's the, is there a connection between the two? Um, I mean, I, th I think producing good work requires a level of humility that borders on sort of paranoia that you're not any good. And once you start to get to the point where you're pretty confident this is good, you're, I think you're at risk of actually not working that well. So, uh, but to sort of aspects of physical danger, um, 
I mean, I, you know, I, I grew up in a very safe suburb of Boston, and um, I wasn't presented with physical threats, physical challenges, except the ones that I created myself. And, I, I, you know, I was a, I mean, I think young men have a need in this society, in any society, to, to, for a kind of, for a kind of rite of passage, to sort of demonstrate to themselves and others that they're, that they're, they're strong of spirit and strong of body and that they're worthy and, and I think that's a very um, ancient impulse and probably a healthy one and if you grow up in a suburb of Boston you, it's not going to happen to you you have to figure out how to do that yourself The suburb you grew up in was? Belmont uh -huh. Not Revere not Revere, but I can do the. If you've grown up in Revere, you, yeah, exactly. That, that, yeah. would, that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Do you, you came to writing later too? You you seem to move around doing a lot of jobs. You were a you were a tree trimmer at, when you when you began your most I guess your best known best selling book. Yeah, I mean I did all those jobs because I couldn't make a living as a writer. I mean I was writing the whole time. It just no one knew about it. Um, I. Uh, I was a, yeah, I was a climber for tree companies. Um, I took trees down. It was a very challenging and frightening job. And um, One that, of the most dangerous jobs around, isn't it, a, a well, tree trimmer? It's very dangerous if you're not good at it. You know, it, 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 <laughs> uh, I, um, and, and that was where, I mean, I was an athlete in college, and I figured out, and this co did come into play in, in Afghanistan, I figured out how to have a relationship with pain. I mean, I was an endurance athlete, I was a, I was a distance runner. And you, you know, pain is part of competition, it's part of running, right? And I was a good runner, I, I ran a fast, had a fast mile time, but the amount of pain in, in that event was just off the charts. And you need to establish a relationship with pain where you're, you're in control of your reaction to it. And, um, and you also, as a reporter, you need to do that with fear, as a, as a, as a war reporter. You need to do that with fear. And I first learned that doing tree work. I work 80 feet in the air with a chainsaw. I got injured doing it. It was very scary. The fear is not going to go away. It shouldn't go away. Um, it's what keeps you safe. But you have to set up, you have to establish a relationship with it, like with a little kid, where you're in control, not it. And I first learned how to do that with tree work. And I watched that play out. In, uh, it, it went straight into journalism. You have a, there's a great quote in, in the book, the coward's fear of death stems in large part from his, capa from his incapacity to love anything but his own body. Yeah. Can you expand on that? Um, if I'm 80 feet in a tree with a chainsaw topping out a pine tree, I'm not doing it for anyone else. I'm up there on my own, and if I do it wrong, I could get killed. There's no larger purpose um, to take refuge in mentally. Um, with soldiers, it's very different. Um, they have such a sense of accountability to each other, such a, a, a love for each other, um, that in firefights, one of their primary concerns is that they not fail their brothers, that they not, because of some lapse of courage or, or lapse of training, that they not get someone else killed. And um, that allows them, that gives them a focus other than themselves. And you're most scared when you're focused on yourself. It's a very self, selfish, self-focused way to be, and your fears can really run away with you. And once you're sort of focused on the welfare of others, um, you, and I experienced this with the platoon, your fear kind of takes a back seat. Um, it's also, I mean, interestingly, that sort of, that idea that like, what happens to others is more important than what happens to you, that you exist for a sort of greater purpose, a great, you exist for the group, for the welfare of the group. Um, it really, in, in a different context, obviously, it is the heart of, of religious thought in every religion in the world, that kind of giving of yourself to, to others. In combat, it happens in a very immediate, very violent, very literal way. But it does have a kind of beautiful manifestation in spirituality.